Kicking off our afternoon sessions, please welcome back to the stage Mike McCarthy with ESPN personality, host, and executive producer Stephen A. Smith. Oh. <laughs> What's going on, y'all? How y'all doing? Stephen A., welcome. Uh, it's great to have you here. It's good to be here. What's going on, man? Um, ever since Sunday, you've been all over this Tyreek Hill arrest. Yeah. And you've been talking about it on your show, you've been talking about it on your podcast. Now that you've had a chance to talk to some folks who are involved and you've seen the police tape, what is your take? Wasn't happy with it, obviously. Um, I, don't, I don't ever say police brutality. I say brutality on the part of some police officers because I don't want to castigate the entire, you know, uh, industry of, of police officers and what have you. I mean, I know that for the most part, most of them protect and serve and they fulfill their obligations and their oath. And I certainly don't want to be one of those people that are irresponsible enough to just paint everybody with a broad brush as a black man. I don't want, I don't want us as black people being stigmatized that way. So I, I, in the interest of fairness, I try to make sure I do the same thing. Um, but I do believe those police officers were a bit excessive. I do believe this, they have a responsibility to, to, de, to de-escalate a situation. I don't think they did that. But I also expressed on first take this morning that I was a little upset at Tyreek Hill because my initial reaction was what it was based on the video that we saw. But then when we saw the video in its entirety right. that was released by the, uh, you know, the Florida Police Department and the Benevolent Association, um, he was uncooperative. When you get pulled over by police, you roll down your damn windows. You don't roll your windows up. When they tell you to roll down your windows, you roll down your windows. When they tell you to hand you their license, they tell you to hand, you hand them your license. And if they ask you to get out the car, you get out the vehicle. And those were all things that he hesitated in doing. And so on one hand, as my colleague at ESPN, Dominic Foxworth, articulated accurately so, the responsibility and the onus does primarily fall on law enforcement officials, and that's true, and you want to make sure the focus belongs there. But in the same breath, what you also want to make sure is you want to do what you can to contribute to lives being saved. And how he conducted himself at the beginning, well, what if the officers panicked because you kept the windows up and they were fearful of what was on the other side of that glass? And that caused them to act wrong. That's something that you have to be careful about, and I think you have to take that into consideration. So again, the primary, primarily the onus is on them. And I don't take back anything I said about those police officers because they didn't serve to de-escalate the situation. But Tyreek Hill wasn't perfect in the scenario. And I wouldn't encourage anybody, especially any black man, that's pulled over by the police to act the way that he acted initially because you might get yourself hurt. And you also noted that there was a difference between his arrest and Scotty Scheffler's. Of course. Scotty Scheffler was uh, walked away. Tyreek was put on the ground. Yeah. To white America, that's usually, the, that's usually how it goes. And y'all need to understand that. It's easier to dehumanize African-American men. The proof is in the pudding. Scotty Scheffler was handcuffed. He was detained. He was taken away. He was arrested. But he wasn't thrown to the ground in 93 degree weather with that asphalt, your face stuck on there. He wasn't lifted up with handcuffs behind his back and then forcibly put back down in the seating position. That did not happen to him. And so, there's one thing, one incident where it involves law enforcement making the decision to enforce the law, and then there's another incident where you had law enforcement officials that did so, but in a more excessive fashion. And that's the kind of things that black folks, particularly black men, usually uh, articulate and usually highlight. Let's talk about your new uh, production company, your podcast, your YouTube show. Yeah. You just had a very newsy interview with Jerry Jones, mm. going into enemy territory, as it were. Something for like that. Something like that. Southern Steve. Not really him. It's just them damn nauseating fans, but they know everybody. Knows <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are your uh, expectations for this show? I mean, you're up to 800,000 subscribers. I mean, are you looking for Joe Rogan territory here? I'm always going to be number one. It's sometimes, uh, obviously, for the most part, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, I've been doing my show for 17 months now. It's, it's bordering on 17 months. So those 800,000 subscribers, nearly 800,000 subscribers, have come within that time period. Some people would look at it and say, well, you started earlier. Well, when I started earlier, I wasn't allowed to use my name. 
I wasn't allowed to be on video. Then when I was ultimately allowed to be on video nearly a year later, I wasn't allowed to be on audio because I had that, that you know, broke, um, ended my radio deal with, with Odyssey. And then ultimately it was like six months later where I went with iHeartRadio. And so because of that, where we really started, where I was able to assemble a team and really go about the business of having my own YouTube channel is about 17 months. And so I'm really happy um, with where it is now, but I'm not satisfied. Um, I got into the, anytime I get into, anytime I decide to do anything, I'm looking at who's number one. I'm studying why they're number one. And my goal is to match or eclipse anybody that I go up against. That's just how I roll. Um, and not to say I'm going up against him because his content is vastly different from mine and I understand that. But I'm looking at the landscape of the industry and you know, I'm, I'm of the mindset that it's always a marathon, it's never a sprint. And anything that I choose to do, I'm here to stay. I'm not a one hit wonder, I'm not trying to win and then go away and right. all that other stuff. When I win, I plan on winning for a very, very long time. That's the approach that I take, that's what I strive to do. And that's exactly what I intend to do with this YouTube show. Uh, it's a podcast, obviously, but that's on the audio side. It's a YouTube show. In the process of that, I'm using that also to springboard my production company, which I just changed. It was Mr. SAS. Now it's called Straight Shooter, taken after the name of my uh, of my uh, book, memoir. Of my memoir. So it's Straight Shooter Production, Straight Shooter Media, Straight Shooter Inc. All of that stuff. And I I plan on engaging in scripted and unscripted content documentary, scripted content, drama series that I created that I'm working in concert with a couple of people, still can't announce it for some reason. Uh, they've asked me not to, but all of those kind of things are the things that I'm working on. But in the process of doing that, I still intend to do my podcast and my show, and I still intend on doing sports television, no matter who that's for. Yeah. Hollywood has come knocking to Straight Shooter. You've got a couple of projects in development, right? Yes, I'm not at liberty to say, but yes, that is true. Yeah. Um, the thing about the show that I find interesting is Stephen A. tackles topics beyond sports. He talks about politics. He talks about pop culture. What kind of reaction have you gotten, you know, to people say, oh, it's Stephen, Stephen A., stick to sports? Oh, you're always going to hear that. Um, anytime we live in our society, you know, listen, rap artists were told to stick to being rappers. You know, actors were told to, be, to stick to acting and not engaging in politics. Sports figures are told the same thing. That's an audience's comfort level for the most part. Once they get to know and identify you um, in a certain genre, they're telling you to stick to that. But as far as I'm concerned, winners don't usually do that. Uh, particularly in this day and age, you expand, you explore, you uh, test the boundaries, find out who you are and what you're made of. I certainly don't want to be poor at anything. Right. So if something, if I'm doing something and I'm not good at it, you know, I'm not going to do it anymore. My daughter convinced me to show up to school, her sc uh, after school session one day and take ice hockey. Uh, you know, I was in ice skates, right? I was uh, doing high hockey. I bust my ass in two seconds. <laughs> I couldn't move two feet. And I fell, and I'm seeing a bunch of young teenagers laughing hysterically at me because I couldn't go two feet. That is the first and the last time I ever tried that <laughs> because I know that is not my thing. And so, you know, but, but I never would have known unless I put on the ice skates and tried it. And so that's my mentality with a lot of different things, things that I'm passionate about. I don't look at me talking politics as me trying to be a political pundit or talk politics per se. I view it as social commentary. I'm a, I'm a black man, I'm an American citizen, I'm a voter, I'm a conscientious observer. I see what's transpiring in the world. People ask me a question, I answer. It just so happens that when I answer questions that are asked of me, people tend to listen and people tend to pay attention. Whether it's to listen to agree or to listen to disagree, somehow, some way, you know, you're gonna have a reaction. And the one thing that I'm not gonna be is boring. And so because of that, if that's what people gravitate to and they wanna hear what I have to say and I think that I have an opinion that's worth noting, I'm gonna speak on it, which is why I've been on everything from Fox News to MSNBC to CNN, the News Nation, you know, and the list goes on and on, Patriot Radio, Urban View Radio, and all of this other stuff in between. You asked me a question as John, the late great John Thompson, a coach, former coach at Georgetown, once said, what I love about Stephen A is that if you if you want to know how he feels, just ask, <laughs> and he'll tell you. Right. And that's pretty much me. You know, I'm not pursuing anything. I'm not calling anybody to ask them to interview me. But if they want to talk about something that I'm interested in talking about, then I try to make myself available. Yeah. There's also a business angle here. I mean, Stephen A is at the forefront of a number of on-air talents who have their own owned and operated production companies. Yes. 
uh, Colin Cowherd, Shannon Sharp, yep. uh, Pat McAfee. Yep. Uh, why is that happening? Does that give you more freedom in your career or more clout come contract time? Um, I guess one could surmise it would be the combination of it all. But essentially, if we're being truthful about it, it's diversifying our portfolio and not leaving us at the mercy of network television. That's what, that's what it really, really comes down to. Um, you know, for me personally, and I'm not speaking for Colin Cowherd or Shannon Sharp, but being as sharp as they are, no pun intended, understanding the business to some degree, you don't want to find yourself in a position where all you have is this one outlet or this one genre to come to you to, you know, feed your coffers and ultimately, you know, uh, pay you what you think you're worth or whatever. You, it gives you an opportunity to find out what you're made of, what you're built for, and, and, and how you can market yourself to be as much as you anticipate or you expect yourself to be. I remember in 2009, when I was let go by ESPN, it was not the greatest experience in the world. I was a new father, I was unemployed. ESPN let me go. I obviously thought I was worth more than they thought I was worth. They said, go ahead and find out what you're worth. And when they let me go, I didn't have one single offer from anywhere. Nobody in television would touch me. Not NBC, ABC, CBS, none of the cable networks, Fox, or anybody else. Not even TV One or BET. Nobody wanted me. And so it was a reality check that I've never let go of. I hold, that on, I hold on to that to this very day. As a black man, I look at myself as a touch away of being, from being unemployed at a moment's notice. And so I'm constantly on my grind. And I'm constantly about the business of trying to be the best, striving to be the best, and showing what I'm worth. Um, but the biggest thing that had happened for me that was so beneficial is that I elevated my knowledge of the business. I knew nothing. People were screaming my name in the streets. There was commercials. I was on bus stops and all of this other stuff. And I thought that somehow quantified my value and identified my value. And I was an absolute fool. I was ignorant beyond ignorance. It really was. And I had to find out the hard way that I had no clue. And it was all my fault because I didn't know the business. So what I did was went about the business of making sure I mastered my business, having an idea of what I was worth, attaching myself to a brand and a product where you got to see me, you could reach out and touch me, you knew where to find me. I was appointment viewing. I wasn't just showing up on different sports centers or different shows. Oh no, at 10 o'clock, every weekday morning, that's when you knew, where, you knew exactly where and when to find me. And so because of that, I was able to build from that point forward and springboard from there. And in the process of doing so, paying attention to ratings, paying attention to revenue, paying attention to what the network's definition of success is, not me trying to define it for myself and leaving my ego and my stupid arrogance to do it. I edified myself about the business that I was in and what would be required in order for me to be all I could be. Yeah. And once I mastered that, it's been a monster mm -hmm. and it's gonna stay a monster because I'm not going away. You're saying is something along the lines of my goal is to make as much money from my bosses as possible and to get some of it myself. Damn right. <laughs> that ain't going to change. That's <laughs> anybody that I work for. I am not a part. This is the United States of America. I'm not going to apologize for being a capitalist. I expect to get paid. Yeah. And I'm not apologizing for that to anybody. Um, I'm going to work my tail off. I'm going to strive to be the best that I can be. I'm going to put in the hours. I'm going to produce results to the best of my ability. And those results are what I'm going to look at to define my worth. Yeah. I'm not going to let my ego or my arrogance or anything like that get in the way. I have been humbled beyond humility over the years. I understand what it is and what comes along with defining who you are and what your worth is. But once I pull that out, Respect it. So I pay attention to the industry. I monitor everything. I monitor their habits, what they define as success. I don't try to define it myself because the bucks are in their coffers, not mine. But what you define as success, what you say defines success and what warrants you getting paid. And this is the evidence because we paid this person and we paid this person and we paid that person. Well, guess what? That's exactly what I'm going to do. And by the way, it's not only wise, it's fair. And the reason I say it's fair is because we cover the world of sports. I use Dak Prescott as a perfect example. I got interviewed. Um, there's an interview coming out uh, with CNN in a few days or so when somebody asked me about uh, 
you know, me and my contract and all of this other stuff. And I brought up Dak Prescott. And they said, Dak Prescott, 60 million a year, and he's the, he's the star quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. I said, he's also somebody that won two playoff games in eight years. And he got that because the market says that's what he warrants. Well, in this business, there's also a market. Yeah. And when you've been number one for 12 years, well, what the hell does that warrant? So to me, it's not like, it's not arrogance. It's not, uh, uh, you know, just a displaced level of confidence or anything like that. It's me looking at the rules and regulations that define what the business and where the business is. And it's me saying, okay, well, if that's what the business says, well, here's where I'm at. So what's the problem? And that's how I look at it. And, and by the way, one of the executives, for, uh, Mr. John Wildhack, uh, who's still my buddy, he used to be the executive VP at ESPN. He's now a, you know, the athletic director at Syracuse, Syracuse University. Yeah. Um, he's, he's, he's a great man. I love him dearly. And uh, we're still friends to this very day. And I remember years ago when he was running ESPN, this is when I knew that he was somebody that I'd want to work for for years to come. I walked up to his office and we were talking about something and I asked him for something that wasn't going to happen. And he said, he smiled at me. You could ask for anything. You understand? Mm. That doesn't mean you're going to get it. And we laughed about it. And the reason why that was so important was because he took no offense to what I asked for. He just let me know that there's an answer. You can ask, but it doesn't mean you're going to get it. Okay? If you think you warrant something and you want it, ask for it. But if you don't get it, you don't get it. The problem that I have with the industry today is you got people that have a problem with you asking. Why have a problem with us asking? We're, it, it, this is a business. You understand? This business has made, has, has elevated my quality of life beyond anything I would have ever dreamed. And I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful. But last time I checked, I ain't dead. I'm still going. <laughs> I'm still going, and I still got a life to live, and I still got goals and aspirations to pursue. What's wrong with that? Yeah. So that's how I look at it. You don't take no for an answer, so um, you get no for an answer. Well, I mean, it's not a matter of taking no for an answer. Sometimes you have no choice because it's not within your control. But just because somebody said no doesn't mean somebody over here is not going to is going to say no. Yeah. And so you have to you have to put yourself in a position where you're marketable enough as a talent, where not only one entity is looking for you or looking at you. You got to make sure you're marketable enough, marketable enough for everybody to pay attention. And I've been blessed and fortunate enough through the grace of God to be in a position where everybody's paying attention. Yeah. And I like it. Yeah. Uh, Front Office Sports recently asked Jimmy Pataro and Burke Magnus both about the state of your contract negotiations. Yep. Uh, if you don't know, Stephen A's contract is up in 2025. They both said they very much want to stay in business with you mm -hmm. uh, as the face of ESPN. Any news you can give us on the negotiations? Not a word. <laughs> it's nothing I can do. They, you know, they've made an offer. I've countered. Um, and that's where we've left it. Yeah. And so, you know, my contract ends in June of 2025. Uh, Disney, the Disney family. I have a great relationship with Bob Iger, uh, who's been incredible to me. Um, Jimmy Pitaro is a great man, one of the nicest people you'd ever meet in your life. I'm still getting to know Burke Magnus, uh, who obviously runs ESPN, and he's doing a damn good job. I don't think anybody can deny that at this particular moment in time. Uh, but they have their vision, and I have mine. Yeah. And if it's aligned, we'll work it out. And if it's not, then decisions have to be made. Yeah. And I'm a big boy, and I accept the fact that sometimes you don't get what you want. You certainly sometimes don't get it from who you want to get it from. And if it comes to a decision where I have to move on, I've prepared myself mentally and emotionally to be able to do that. I don't want it to come to that because I am very happy at ESPN doing what I do. I love doing first take every day, um, every weekday at 10 a.m. I love the other opportunities that potentially could present itself at the Worldwide Leader, but I'm a human being, and everybody wants to be wanted. And I believe them when they say what they say. They've certainly told me what they've told you in fairness to them, and I've always had a great relationship with them. But at the end of the day, they'd be the first to tell me, this is business. 
So I'm going to be the second to tell everybody else, yeah. this is business. And in the end, what it comes down to is whatever opportunities are available. If somebody wants you bad enough, they show you. And by the way, it's not always with money. It's how you're treated. It's the kind of latitude they give you. It's the kind of support that they give you. It's the way they stand up for you and they stand by you. Um, and in my position, those things definitely hold true because I'm a different animal. I've been there for 20 years, you know, with the exception of the two years that I was gone from 2009 to 2011. I've been there for 20 years. I'm a product of the Disney family. And I don't think there's many people that can say that 20 years in, you're number one. But I can. What does that worth? What is that worth? How much does that matter? Those are questions that I have. Yeah. So when you or anybody else comes my way and you're asking those questions, I'm literally looking at you and internalizing, like, what you're asking me for? <laughs> They're the ones with the power. It's their call. They know what I want. They know what I've meant. They know what my value is. They know what I bring to the table. They know how hard I work. They know how committed I've been. They know I'm family. What you gonna do? Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> um, if you haven't read Stephen A's memoir, Straight Shooter, it's terrific reading. And one of some of my favorite parts about him growing up in Hollis, Queens, and your idol was Howard Cosell. Yeah. Uh, here is somebody who in his 50s went from boxing the Olympics to football, and now we basically remember him, you know, for football, for Monday Night Football. Yes. And you and I spoke in Bristol recently. You talked about maybe becoming the next Howard Cosell. Is that it's still on your radar? Yeah. Yes, it is. This is exactly what I want. Doesn't mean, again, I'm going to get it. I don't make that decision. Last time I checked, they had a Monday Night Football game last night with a Monday Night Countdown. I wasn't part of that. Right. So, I mean, I can want whatever. That doesn't mean it's going to happen. But you asked me a question about what was on my wish list. Um, and I've made that clear. And so it's something that I want to do because um, I've been blessed and fortunate to be number one. Last time I checked, the number one sports brand is the NFL. So why shouldn't the number one, one, number one guy on the air be a part of the number one product? That's how I view it, um, especially since I grew up idolizing Howard Cosell, um, thinking about him and what he brought to the table in terms of his diction, his cadence, his tenor, um, his candor. Um, his willingness to tackle issues that most individuals in the industry weren't willing to tackle at that particular moment in time. These are the kind of things that First Take has done. And, and when I say First Take, I'm certainly not talking about myself. I, you know, there are an abundance of people, every single, you know, one of the things that I've said, and I've said this to you before, and I'll say it again, um, I think one of the things that people don't realize, when you think about First Take, I don't know if there's a luckier person in the business than me when it comes to first take. Because three years ago when they handed me the baton after Max Kellerman departed from the show and they gave it to me and they asked me to be, because I didn't ask to be the executive producer, I didn't want that, but they asked me to do it. Every single contributor on the show I went to and I told them what would be needed. And I don't know if somebody can look at 14 or 15 different people and say, none of them let me down. Right. I mean, they all showed up, every single one of them, male, female, black, white, and everything in between. Every single person that has, has contributed, has been a contributor to First Take, they've all done this for me. And so I wouldn't be sitting up here with you today. I wouldn't have the success that I have on First Take if it were not for all of them. Yeah. I love all of them, and I owe them all a debt of gratitude. And any time I have an opportunity to behind the scenes, it ain't for everybody to know, but I fight for everybody yeah. because they looked out for me. They didn't have to. They were going to do their job. They were going to come on the air, and they were going to, you know, say what they say and all of this other stuff, but they performed. Yeah. And I needed them to do that. And so I wouldn't be sitting up here today in the position that I'm in if it were not for all of them coming together and looking out for me. Because make no mistake about it, whether it's true or not, um, only the bosses can say, but I certainly felt like my career was on the line. That if I was not successful at that particular moment in time with First Take, that it would cost me everything. Yeah. And they all came through. And, and, I, and I love them and I appreciate all of them for it. Yeah. Speaking of new opportunities, uh, you know, we've all been following these NBA negotiations. Yep. Uh, and both NBC 
and ESPN said, in a perfect world, they'd love to have Charles Barkley. Yep. Could you see uh, an NBA countdown, Stephen A and Charles Barkley? Probably not. Um, because Charles Barkley don't want to work that much. <laughs> uh, I'm just telling you what the brother said. I mean, this, these are his words, not mine. That's my man. I love him to death. Charles Barkley, I've seen Charles Barkley walk by executives and say, I'd never work for y'all asses. Y'all work to people too hard. <laughs> to their face. I've seen him do it. You know, and so, um, you know, for him to be in studio, for him to be a part of the sports centers, pre and post games, the halftime in betweens and all of this other stuff, multiple days out of the week and stuff like that. I, I, I can't see it. I would welcome it. I would love it. Uh, for me and Charles Barkley to be on the set together, that would be a dream come true. But they're all my brothers. I mean, Kenny Smith's brother used to train me, Vincent Smith at Lost Battalion Hall in Queens, New York. Shaq and I go back over 20, 25 years. Um, Ernie Johnson is just phenomenal. He's the greatest. And, and, and imagining him not on the NBA coverage is, is something that should depress all of us. Uh, but Charles Barkley and I together, oh, you damn right. That's, uh, that's absolutely something I would welcome. Yeah. That would be a dream team. I wouldn't say that. I think they already have the dream team with all due respect to them. I mean, it doesn't get much better than Barkley with Kenny Smith and Shaq. Um, I'm certainly not going to go that far, but I believe I can hold my own with anybody. Yeah. So I don't, you know, it is what it is. Barkley and I together on the set, it would be hellacious, but I don't think it would be hellacious. <laughs> I don't think it would be hellacious for us as much as it would be hellacious for the NBA players and coaches. Right. It would be hellacious for them because we ain't going to pull punches. We ain't going to bite our tongues. That's for sure. Uh, Stephen A. has referenced it, but he's also the executive producer of First Take. 23 straight months of growth, to, uh, successful to the point where FS1 uh, had to redo their whole morning lineup. One of the things I love about what you've done in First Take is you've created a feeder system for up-and-coming talent. You feature people, uh, different people all the time. Monica McNutt, uh, who's going to be up on the stage in, in a little bit. Kimberly A. Williams, Marcus Spears. You know, to me, they, they really got their first exposure. Kimberly Martin. Yeah. yeah. yeah right. Sorry. Sure. And talk about that strategy. Well, like I said, I mean, I just think you got to pay attention to the audience. You brought up Monica McNutt. She's yeah. sensational. Everybody think that, you know, she and I got some beef. They don't know me very well. I love her to death. Um, you know, Janae Ogumake, Andrea Carter, Kimberly Ma and Mina Kimes, Molly Karam, of course. Um, we've, got, we've got a roster full of ladies who have been nothing short of spectacular, and I think they've added a lot to this industry. I don't think they get the respect um, and, the, and the appreciation they deserve because they bring a lot to the table. And I think that the thing that I find fascinating, and it's not to say that we don't disagree or, you know, we might not get in heated discussions. We might not even be salty with each other for a few minutes thereafter, but it ain't going to last more than a few minutes. At the end of the day, what people don't understand about a platform like First Take is that we're having a problem with, the audience is having a problem with us if we disagree, if we do agree, I'm sorry. If we do agree, the objective is tension. The objective is to disagree. The objective is point, counterpoint, opposite points of view. That's what makes the world go round. That's what it's supposed to be. And so when people are of the mindset that it's not supposed to be that way, they're a bit clueless in that regard. It's supposed to be a little tension. And sometimes, in fairness, I've had to talk to the bosses about that. If they've disagreed with something that I've said or whatever, I'd literally look at them like, so? Who told you we were supposed to agree? You put me on a platform to say something you might disagree with. That's what makes it go. As long as I'm not crossing third rails and being flagrantly insensitive or anything like that, what is the problem? Who told you that I go on the air for you to agree with me? No, I'm going on the air to say something and provide a perspective that's factual, uh, that has a, an appropriate line that's not being crossed, but that also makes you think that you might be wrong, that makes you think of something differently than you may have been thinking about it. That's why we've got whites and blacks and Asian and Hispanics and everybody else, because everybody's coming from a different lens than you might be coming from, and everybody is fed. That's why it was so important for me to have that potpourri of individuals coming through the show time and time and time again. Because anytime you tune in the first take, you don't know what you're going to get more and more. You know I'm going to be there. You know I'm going to stir the cup. 
but you don't know who I'm going up against, what they're going to say, what kind of perspective that they're going to, they're going to provide to elevate and edify the mindset of the audience watching us. And that is what it's all about. And so for me, you know, to me, it's like I got great producers on the show. They do most of the work. My primary responsibility as executive producer of the show is I'm the one who determines the roster. And I'm the one that's going to determine the rundown at the end of the day. But all that other work that comes with it, that's all them. I only care about that content and who are the individuals volleying back and forth, creating perspectives for all of you to consider. But don't kid yourself, his competitive edge has not been blunted. Uh, when I talked to Stephen A. up in Bristol a couple of weeks ago, he said no matter who he's up against on TV, his objective is annihilation. How do you distill that, that ethos into your team? Well, you follow the lead. And, you know, I'm not leading anybody. I'm leading the show. And if you're on the show, if I look at you and I see that you're somebody that doesn't care, that winning doesn't matter to you, that your perspective is something you're just articulating, but you don't really care whether or not it has resonance. If you're somebody that's that distant and separate, apart from having an impact, I'm getting rid of you. I'm not gonna hesitate, you gotta go. I won't blink. I'll look at you and I'll see somebody and I joke around and stuff like that with people that you know how they dress, how they how they present themselves, how they speak and all this stuff. I'm joking, but they also know I'm halfway serious because if I know what I'm going against and I know what I'm trying to accomplish and establish. And if I don't like what I'm seeing, you're not gonna be back. It's that simple. We hit a win. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that's going on in this world. You know, revenue matters, ratings matter. It's a lot of stuff going on. We don't have time for the nonsense. You gotta be about the business of winning. You can't be somebody that thinks that you just go to work. All right, so I went to work and I showed up, so I deserve my check. Yeah, you got a contract. Yeah, the obligation's gonna be met. Yes, it's true, okay, you did your job. But we all know what bosses are looking for. They're looking for the exceptions to the rules, not the rules. You, you want somebody that's about having an impact, that's about making sure that it's felt. You understand we're in the revenue and the ratings business. Ratings generate revenue. You cannot go on linear television and not think about ratings. You cannot be in our business and not thinking about revenue. You can't be of the mindset that I deserve this money because, oh, I'm so good. Well, what defines you as good? When I come up here and I talk to you, everybody brings up ratings and everybody talks about contract, contract, contracts. They're not asking me why I think the way that I think. And what I'm saying to them is because I bring ratings. Ratings generate revenue. I happen to know that, guess what? When I first showed up at first take, the revenue that we were generating is now 10 times more than it was when I first arrived, okay? So I'm not like, oh my goodness, I'm on TV, I'm popular, they're screaming my name, pay me. No, there's money that's being generated here. Yeah, you get most of it. Can I get some of that? <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that, and that's what you have to think, but why should a boss, why should an employer look at you any differently than they'd look at the typical person if all you're doing is going to work every day and going home and you're paying no attention to what generates money. I pay attention to what generates money. I'm following the money all the time, all the time, like in every day all the time. I'm watching because that is what I use to define how rational and reasonable I am in my pursuit of what I want. If I'm not delivering for them, then guess what? I don't deserve them delivering it for me. Yeah. You could pay me a boatload of money now. If my numbers slip and dip, when my contract is up years from now, you don't have to fire me. You could come to me and say, you deserve less. And I'm gonna take less because the results showed I deserved less. But if I deserve more, I'll be damned if I'm not gonna ask for more. Yeah. And that's the way it goes. And I think that everybody should think like that. You've talked about the possibility of moving into politics, news, acting, as we all know, your brick on General Hospital, yeah. your, your favorite brick. soap. What does the future hold for Stephen A? Um, 
it's going to be a little more acting. You know, uh, General Hospital is, you know, trying to create some love interest. I like being a mobster. <laughs> I like being, you know, the surveillance expert for the mob, you see? But they, you know, all of a sudden, they did some focus groups or whatever, and they talking about a love interest, and I'm like, eh, <laughs> all right, you know, if you must. <laughs> but that's not really where my interest lies. But I, I, I've been, what I've loved about, and I'm no actor. They think I am, but I don't think I am. What I loved about, what I loved, what I've discovered that I love about it, though, is that you can get away with being whatever the role says you are, no matter what. If that's what the role says it is, everybody will forgive you because you're acting. So I mean, I was like, oh, I, I can get away with this. I can get away with that. Okay. Mm. So that excites me about it in that regard. Um, politics. No, people have asked me about that. I'm not interested in any politics. I like talking about it. I like talking about uh, providing social commentary and talking about the issues that are pertinent to my community and America as a whole. That interests me, but nothing further than that. Yeah. I, don't, I like talking about it. I have no desire, zero, to run for office. I like my life. I ain't trying to be in that cesspool. So no, that's not yeah. true. That's not true. But I, I'm enjoying acting more. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying, I'm, I'm fascinated by um, building my own production company. I've hired a couple of more people. I've got more people coming on board. Um, and I'm about to try to take this by storm. There's people that I'm in the process of collaborating with. There are people down the pike that I will be collaborating with. And I'm really, really excited about that. I'm very excited about my YouTube show because that's not going away. My YouTube show and my podcast, I'm going to be doing that for years to come. I might amp it up to five days a week for all I know. I mean, I just don't get tired of it. I don't know how to explain it, uh, but I like to work. I like to be on my grind. I like people. I like the thought of people trying to go up against me and thinking that they can handle the schedule that I handle. I like that. I, I want to see if they can pull it off, how long they can. I like that stuff. Um, but also in a perfect world. Um, I'll maintain doing what I've been doing because we've established something really, really great and really special with First Take. And, you know, in my perfect world, I I'd like to keep that going. We'll see what happens. But again, doing NBA Countdown on ABC, that's likely. Doing Monday Night Countdown is something that I want to do. Um, and, and come hella high water, I intend to pull it off. And hopefully it'll be where I'm at. If it's not, it's not. Yeah. Last question. We've got a little something called the presidential debate uh -oh. coming up. Yeah. How does the master of embrace debate, how do you, what do you think is going to happen as debate? Any predictions? <sighs> I don't have any predictions because it's hard to say. I haven't really seen Kamala Harris in action. I know that she's a highly intelligent individual. I do not appreciate the disrespect that has been court, accorded to her. She's an HBCU grad. She's a black woman. Uh, she is somebody that was a lawyer, that was a district attorney, that was a state attorney general, that was a senator, that's now the vice president. I think her name, her credentials, her reputation warrants more respect than she has been shown. But I'm also a big boy about it. It is politics. And anything, sometimes it's not about what you're doing. It's about who you're convincing. And when you have a constituency out there and you're fighting for the presidency of the United States of America, people are going to engage in low ball tactics. What I see from a guy like Trump is somebody who's more flagrant with it than previous politicians have been throughout the years. And so that makes it a bit more intriguing, to say the least. I think he will go low. I think he will get personal. I think he will lean towards misogyny to some degree. I think he will try to unravel her. I think they will make uh, egregious accusations about her character, her past relationships and things of that nature to sort of influence their constituency, but also to make sure that they agitate her to some degree. And this belief that she has to maintain composure, well, you're talking to the wrong dude about that. <laughs> I think that she has to turn around and she's got to hit him low too. You know, this, I mean, it ain't like she don't have, a, it ain't like she's devoid of the ammunition. She's got plenty of ammunition and she's going to have to come out there swinging because if you look at some of the things that he said, even with the product, that's why I went off on my podcast this last show when I was talking about enough of the hiding, 
you know, Biden was the president. They greased the skid so he didn't have any competition for the primary, so there was no primary. And then ultimately, he shows his face on June 27th, and we learn that respectfully, our president he just didn't seem to have it anymore. Yeah. And so obviously the Democratic donors and what have you forced him out. She comes in there. You put her in there. And what does she do? She's using rallies as interviews. No. No, that's not the same thing. You got to go up there and fight fire with fire. He's showing up everywhere despite 34 felony convictions, two impeachments, multiple civil suits against him. He's going out there and showing his face everywhere. And then he's bringing up the war in Ukraine. He's bringing up the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in Gaza and beyond. He's bringing up some stuff that's going on with our borders, stuff that's going on in this country. And he's saying, where is she? He's doing that on purpose because this is an engagement in misogyny where he's trying to imply I'm a man, I'm strong, I'm willing to show up and fight. Where is she at? You can't answer that by not showing up yourself. There, it's working now, please don't get me wrong. I was making the point, it's not going to continue to work. You're gonna have to show up and show out just like he does. Wherever he goes, you're gonna have to show up and be like, I'm here too, let's get it on. You're gonna have to treat him like he's hiding. You need to run from me. It ain't the other way around. She has to do that because you'll never have a candidate providing you more ammunition to do so than he, uh, than he does. And if you don't do that, then they're going to piggyback off of Biden. They're going to look at what he avoided. They're going to say, you're, you're, mirroring, you're mirroring that strategy. The Dems forced you to do this. That's not the right way to go. And it's going to be an excuse for a whole bunch of people to say, we're living in some trying times. We think he's tougher. We want to go in that direction. That's his only play. That's his only play. I know she's, they say she's flip-flop fracking and health care and the border and all of this other stuff. She can get past that. What you can't get past is that ladies have been telling us and showing us throughout history marginalization, pigeonholing, and things of that nature where they're concerned, society not appreciating what these ladies bring to the table. You can't turn around with all of that noise clearly in your favor as ladies, you as Kamala Harris, and then give him ammunition to piggyback off of that and think it's going to work for you. It's not. He's a target. Take him out. That's what she has to do. You can't do that if he's seen every way and she's not. Well, Stephen A., thank you for your time. Please join me in a round of applause. Thank you. Folks, please keep your seats as we get ready to welcome our next guest. Please stay in your seats.